In November 2008, exactly 29 years to the day that an Air New Zealand DC-10 flew into the side of an Antarctic mountain, an Air New Zealand Airbus A320 plunged into the ocean in the south of France. Maintenance shortcuts three days prior, an incorrect flight plan, and the pilot's disregard for operating procedure were largely to blame for the accident. On Thursday the 27th of November 2008, an Airbus A320 in Air New Zealand livery took off from Perpignan in the south of France. After a two-year lease to German airline XL Airways, the flight was to test whether the aircraft was in working order before returning to its owner, Air New Zealand. As part of the lease agreement, Air New Zealand wanted the test conducted as per the Airbus program, a series of technical manoeuvres to test the plane to its limits, designed to be performed by qualified test pilots, which the pilots on this flight were not. Taking off at around 2.45pm, the captain was 51-year-old Norbert Kappel of XL Airways, the first officer was 58-year-old Theodore Ketzer from the same airline. Seated in the jump seat was senior Air New Zealand captain, 52-year-old Brian Horrell. In the cabin were three engineers from Air New Zealand and one other aviation official. What the crew of Flight 888 were unaware of was that lazy maintenance on the aircraft three days before was about to exasperate the mistakes they would shortly make. The flight plan had them flying to the northwest of France turning south over the Bay of Biscay, then heading back to Perpignan for a quick touch and go, and then on to Frankfurt, Germany. Shortly after takeoff, the crew of Flight 888 requested the airspace and heading to begin their manoeuvres. However, they were firmly told no by air traffic control. I'm afraid we cannot do test flights in general air traffic. You have to be operational air traffic, sir, for that. XL Airways, instead of completing an operational air traffic flight plan, which would have allowed their tests with the assistance of a dedicated controller, had filed a general aviation flight plan and in the busy skies of Europe, this did not accommodate for test flights. After further pleas to the controller were rejected, the crew decided to turn around and head back to Perpignan. Regardless though, they would improvise on the way and do as many of the tests as they could and air traffic control would be none the wiser. On the flight back to Perpignan, the crew requested clearance to 39,000 feet to test the auxiliary power unit. A somewhat irked controller who seemingly knew what they were up to replied, You know you are on general aviation and many sectors above, so it's a bit more difficult for us. However, despite his clear annoyance, the request was granted. The crew of Flight 888 proceeded to test the auxiliary power unit, bank angle protections and the overspeed warning among other things. However, the final test was going to be by far the most dangerous. What the crew were unaware of was, three days earlier after being painted into the Air New Zealand livery back in Perpignan, their plane had been washed using a fire hose. According to the Airbus painting procedures, the removal of dust before final application should only be done by hand with an anti-dust cloth. Running behind schedule though, the paint crew at EAS Industry in Perpignan opted to spray it with water to save time. Worse yet, they failed to cover the vital sensors on the side of the aircraft. While being sprayed with the fire hose, water penetrated deep within two of the three angle of attack sensors. The angle of attack sensors on the side of the aircraft are movable sensors. Measuring the pitch of the aircraft relative to the oncoming airflow, the information from the sensors feeds directly to the onboard computers where it's used for several vital systems, one of which is the aircraft's automated stall protection. What the pilots were also unaware of was, the water inside angle of attack sensors 1 and 2 had frozen solid, rendering the information they were transmitting inaccurate. Sensor 3 continued to work as normal. The onboard computers, now receiving conflicting information, were designed to reject any one sensor that deviated from the other two. This, in any other situation, would be ideal. However, as sensors 1 and 2 froze showing the same pitch, it meant sensor 3, the correct one, was the one the computer rejected. What this meant was the onboard computer no longer knew the correct pitch of the aircraft, and critical to the video, advanced systems such as the automated stall protection could no longer function correctly. Although neither the computer nor the pilots knew this. Although not an ideal situation, this would have little to no effect on most flights. But it's what the pilots did next that would compound the situation. 
Continuing their descent to Perpignan, the crew of Flight 888 signed off with the Bordeaux air traffic controller who gave them a sharp send-off. Next time, sir, it'll be better not to do your flight in general aviation. Clearly irked, his instructions had not been followed. From there, continuing with their checks, it was now running out of time that senior Air New Zealand captain Brian Horrell, seated in the jump seat, raised the question of the low speed test. This was a questionable decision. A low speed stall test should be performed at 14,000 feet. Flight 888 was now at 12,000 feet and descending. The A320, like all modern Airbus, is fitted with a state-of-the-art fly-by-wire system with several automated safety features, one of which is the low-speed stall protection. In simple terms, if the speed of the aircraft nears the minimum speed to fly, the onboard computer will automatically apply thrust to prevent the plane from stalling. In even simpler terms, in a low-speed test, the pilots intentionally try and stall the aircraft to test the system works. As Flight 888 descended through 6,000 feet, it was cleared to land in Perpignan. Not keen to test the stall protection while passing through a layer of cloud, the German captain said, I think we will have to do the slow flight probably later. To which his New Zealand counterpart replied, OK, yeah. Or we do it on the way to Frankfurt, or we even skip it, the German added, clearly not comfortable with it. This suggestion went unanswered. However, at a little over 3,000 feet, now clear of the clouds, it was the German who brought it up again, asking his New Zealand counterpart for instructions to perform the test. With barely 3,000 feet between them and the ocean, following instructions of the New Zealand pilot sitting in the jump seat, Captain Norbert Kappel moved the throttles to idle and raised the nose of the aircraft by pulling back on his side stick, dramatically slowing the speed of the aircraft. At just 3,000 feet, this test was madness. If the stall protections did fail, they would have no space to save the flight. As shown in this diagram, the red line is the speed at which the plane will stall. Above it in the orange is the speed at which the computer will automatically apply power to prevent that stall. This is what the pilots were testing. Unfortunately, one of several consequences of the faulty data from the angle of attack sensors was the computer incorrectly estimated the speed at which the plane would stall to be much lower than it actually was. In simple terms, the plane would stall long before the protections kicked in. As the speed of the aircraft dropped to a critical point in which it could no longer maintain flight, a stall alarm sounded in the flight deck. The plane shook and made a hard bank to the left. After applying full power, initially the crew were able to regain control again and come out of the stall. However, the aircraft now began a rapid and uncontrolled climb. What the pilots hadn't noticed, in the chaos, the aircraft had switched to alternate law, meaning normally automated controls were now left to the pilots. Although the captain was pushing forward on his side stick in an attempt to lower the nose again, the plane kept climbing. In normal law, moving the side stick prompts the computer to adjust the horizontal stabilizer to control the pitch. Now, in alternate law, with no assistance from the computer, the pilots needed to use both the side stick and the manual trim wheel to lower the nose of the aircraft. A warning on their display advised them of this, but tragically they likely didn't notice. Reaching 57 degrees nose up, while in a hard bank to the left, their altitude peaked at just below 4,000 feet and the airspeed dropped to just 40 knots, far too low to fly. Shuddering violently, the plane began an unstoppable plunge towards the ocean. The investigation into the accident was led by France's Bureau of Inquiry and Analysis for Civil Aviation Safety, with the participation of its German, New Zealand and American counterparts. The flight deck data recorder and voice recorder were retrieved from the ocean, and investigators spent the following two years piecing together the events leading to the accident, the details of which were outlined in this video. The crash of Flight 888 has largely been portrayed, at least in New Zealand, is a mostly German crash by the German pilots with the help of some faulty sensors on an Air New Zealand owned plane, but that's always been unfair. Rather, it was an almost willful chain of mistakes that started with the paint crew three days before the crash, topped off by the pilots from both airlines. The crash of Flight 888 underscores the critical importance of following operating procedures. It shows how seemingly minor deviations by multiple individuals 
can lead to catastrophic consequences. Let me know your thoughts on this accident. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love it if you subscribed and joined me for the next one. To watch another of my aviation videos, you can click the link on the screen. And as always, thanks for watching.